this is a chapter on cost of capital. Um, capital basically has three components, debt, preferred stock, and common equity. And when the costs of these three components are combined, we have something called WACC, WAC as they just typically call it. It's the weighted average cost of capital. So let's look into it, see what it is. <clears throat> it's some basic, very targeted homework questions there. Um, you should have the solutions to that, you know, look at them after you've tried it yourself. And in my experience, it actually helps the student, you know, from attem attempting the question. Otherwise, uh, a large percentage won't even try it. Why do we need the cost of capital? It's a key input into the long-term capital budgeting process. Basically, the firm needs. So this is a corporate finance chapter. A little different, you know, from, 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 from the investment topics that we've had and before that, the financial institutions topics on interest rates. So their finance is basically three parts, three major parts. Um, financial institutions like banks and policy uh, making organizations, investments, which is uh, basically asset management firms, mutual funds, uh, sell side firms, and then corporate finance is finance as practiced in non-finance companies. So the corporate finance divisions of uh, Home Depot, IBM, they are bigger than a lot of the banks that we have. So firm needs to decide what fixed assets to purchase. So the classic production function is basically that production is a function of K and L, which is, uh, is the function of capital and wages and labor. And, and so you can produce something if you have capital and you have labor. So Google can produce something because it has capital and labor. Maybe it has more labor and the capital that it requires to produce that is basically you know, an, an office room uh, with some computing devices. And then you can have a capital intensive company, let's say General Motors, uh, General Dynamics, where there's a lot of uh, equipment, uh, fixed assets, as I say, and, uh, and of course they have human capital to run it. <coughs> Both of them are costly. There's a cost of capital and the cost of labor is wages. Um, I've been saying this for a while. Uh, this is actually the classic Cobb Douglas production function is a version of that. And uh, I think information should be added to this uh, function actually, uh, because information itself, I think on it stands on its own feet and it's a factor of production. So such as if you think of a traffic report, uh, if, if your GPS actually incorporates a traffic report from crowd fund, uh, crowdsourcing or something like that, it'll actually make you take a different route if, if you get the report on a GPS that the interstate is actually blocked because of a major accident. Um, it actually happened to me, of course, I did not have a traffic activated GPS and I was in a parking lot on I-95 South going to Portland for three hours, uh, almost missed the flight out of Boston. <clears throat> uh, good website to buy computer gear that will literally change which way you go, right? With a click of a mouse. So one was literally non-digital and the other is digital. So information should be a part of the production function anyway, but you guys can work on that production function in the future. What types of long-term capital do, we, do firms use? Long-term debt, preferred stock, and common equity. Common equity, basically, you know, uh, equity. Like, like uh, just, now, just now Twitter went, uh, went public, so they have now access to common equity. Earlier they just had private, private equity. <clears throat> Should we focus on before tax or after tax capital gains? Well, the tax effects, one of the things about the cost of capital, and remember we're talking about it, we've changed. We're not individual investors here. We're looking at it from uh, the firm perspective. Is uh, Tax consideration is a big part of how a firm raises its capital. And most firms incorporate tax effects in the cost of capital. Therefore, we focus on after-tax costs. And the cost of debt is affected because there's, some, there's a tax shield to debt, actually to the interest on debt, as opposed to dividends on stock. There is no, the law does not say that you can get a tax shield on that. And that actually creates a, a change in the proportion of how much of a firm capital is raised by debt or by equity. 
Should we focus on historical embedded costs or new marginal costs? The cost of capital is to make decisions which involve new capital. So we focus on marginal costs and not historical costs. So remember, there's three parts to it, you know, uh, bonds, preferred stock, and equity. So this is a nice recap here. So no new information. Like I said, there's, there's basically one piece of new information in this chapter. Um, so if you think of a stereo system, you know, the different components, you know, are there, and we are just hooking the components up together, the amp and the tuner and the speakers and so on and so forth. So in this case, you have a 15-year 12% semi-annual bond. It sells for 115372. Uh, what is the cost of debt? RD is the cost of debt. <clears throat> so semi-annual, so this 12% becomes 120 divided by 2, that's 60. And your 500 payment is going to be 60 plus 1,000, the face value of the bond. So that goes here. Here's 60, present value is the same. And it's 15 years, so that's 15 times 2, that's 30. And so compute IY is going to give you 5%, that's uh, on a, it's for a six-month period. And so that becomes 10% is your cost of debt here. But we are not done here. So this is also one additional piece of new information, sub-information here. Is interest is tax deductible from a company's point of view? The interest they pay is called to service their bonds is tax deductible. So the after-tax cost of debt is actually, so this 10% was BT. So like I said, you know, this is not really math. I mean, it is a little bit of algebra if you want to think about it, or even not that arithmetic. It's a lot of notation. BT is before tax. RD is R the interest rate, D debt. And 1 minus T, that's your corporate tax rate. So let's say we say the basic average corporate tax rate is 40%. So the after-tax cost of debt is 6%. So actually, it doesn't cost the company 10% to issue debt, rather 6%. So you guys really need to know that and factor that in your calculations. At this point, we are ignoring flotation costs. Flotation costs, if you think of it, they're basically, you know, basically commission. It's like... If, if you approach a bank, Goldman Sachs or someone, to, uh, to raise, you know, $500 million of debt for you, you think they're going to do it for free? Why should they do it for free, you know? If it's free, it's probably bad, right? As you guys know by now. So they're, they're going to charge you something. But that just makes the equation a little more complex, but we'll deal with it later in the chapter. Since you're graduate students, we're going to do that too. Yeah. What's the cost of preferred stock? Well, in this case... So that, that was for bonds. For preferred stock, you know, uh, it's currently trading at 113.1. It's 10% quarterly. The power value is 100. And in this case, the flotation cost is $2. Flotation cost means that's the commission there. It's, it's $2 for every preferred stock that's issued. So using this formula, which is basically we saw it in, in, in the chapter on stocks, so the current price, is basically uh, your dividend stream, which is an annuity here, divided by the interest rate, so you move it around here, is 10% uh, times 100, and you don't get, the company doesn't get to keep the 113 bucks. Two dollars of that goes to the investment uh, bank that helped uh, issue the debt, and so your cost of preferred stock is basically 9%. You can also look at it a different way, you know, this $2.50 is quarterly, so it's $2.50, $2 you know, uh, uh, times four, that's 10 bucks, and it's that. Is preferred stock more or less risky to investors than debt? It's still more risky. The company is not required to pay the preferred dividend, whereas in debt, they are required to pay the coupons. What are the two ways the companies can raise common equity? One is directly by issuing new shares and indirectly by reinvesting earnings that are not paid out as dividends. Now, this is less well-known and less understood. So the retained earnings of a company, they're very valuable. This is where a lot of corporate misgovernance happens. I mean, huge. In fact, the 2002 debacle that happened in the U.S. Uh, equity markets was a result of uh, companies thinking that the retained earnings where like discretionary funds at the discretion of senior management. Companies like Tyco, Adelphia Cable, um, 
MCI WorldCom, and I'm blanking out. What, what was that company in Texas that did all the funny stuff? The big one. Enron, Enron thank you. Yeah, how could I forget that? I mean, they had like fake telephones that were not connected. Did I tell you that story? So their trading room, you know, with nice glass and everything, with, and, and, and they had like computer screens and telephones. And so when Wall Street analysts would come to, you know, evaluate the company and see what they're doing, they would like ring a bell and everybody would get busy on the phones making energy trades, you know. And those phones weren't even connected. I mean, that was just the biggest house of cards these guys built, you know. I mean, really. And I, that was a multi-billion dollar company that literally ran into the ground. So, uh, but, but anyway, that's, uh, so, so, so uh, a lot of senior management at that time, you know, there, there's, there's um, the, the, the Tyco chairman is reportedly having bought a $10,000 shower curtain, you know, uh, for his uh, administrative assistant. I mean, I would like to see that shower curtain. I'd like to take a shower behind that curtain, you know. <laughs> I mean... I mean, what does it have, an LCD screen, you know, with, with, uh, with full access to all kind of satellite cables that we cannot discuss here, you know? I mean, well, I mean give me a break, you know? But that's shareholder money. That's, that's corporate earnings. That's corporate earnings, and I'll show you, you know, why it's expensive, you know? If you don't, if you don't, because corporate, basically, remember this, retained earnings don't have flotation costs, so that's why they're cheaper. If a company doesn't have retained earnings and they need $100 million, they have to go to the equity markets and pay somebody, you know, 6 7% uh, to raise that. Whereas if they have uh, retained earnings, they can just use that. That's why retained earnings are a form of equity. Actually, that's in this slide here. Why is there a cost of reinvested earnings? Earnings can be reinvested as uh, dividends, you know. They can be reinvested or paid out as dividends. Investors could buy other securities. So if you are... If you are uh, AMD or Texas Instruments and you've run out of ideas, uh, go and buy Intel stock as a company, you know. You acknowledge that, okay, Intel guys are smarter than AMD, uh, AMD folks, you know, fine. And, uh, but if you're wasting that money, then it's a problem. And I've been told, by the way, guys means both, uh, both genders, you know, so it's a gender neutral term as far as I know. I've been here 23 years, that's all I know. Yeah. So bottom line is, guys, folks, there's an opportunity cost if the earnings are reinvested and equal to the re uh, required return on similar stock. And so that opportunity cost is the cost of uh, equity or cost, uh, equity stands S or cost of the stock uh, from your stock position there. And so if that retained earnings are wasted, there's that opportunity cost. So you should not, you should be very careful with retained earnings. But it's a, it's a lot of problem. It's the problem is continuous on that because the, the company management sees that huge pool of money sitting there and they have a certain discretion. They can throw lavish parties. I mean, really. I mean, you know, really lavish parties on remote islands. And they say, oh, it's a corporate, uh, you know, offsite. But, you know, you can do a lot of things on a corporate offsite. Three ways to determine cost of equity. <clears throat> so but actually this topic sort of came up, you know, is like there's a section on valuation for your uh, portfolio project. And, uh, you know, my role is of a sounding board. I, I don't want to emphasize or insist on any one method, but, and there, there are many. I mean, in fact, uh, there's a, the valuation criteria, you know, price to cash flow, price to book, price to sales. And uh, the literature is very vast and deep. You, for, for every five papers that are saying that price to sales is a good indicator of uh, expected returns, there'll be probably six papers that are saying that that information is already reflecting in price to cash flow or is irrelevant. But some of the big ones are the CAPM, where the cost of equity is basically a function of your risk-free rate, the risk premium, and beta. And the discounted cash flow, which is beta-free, and is a function of your dividends, the growth rate of dividends, the current price, and so on and so And a simpler one actually for companies that don't trade publicly is own bond yield plus risk premium. So this is like literally like just back of the envelope. Uh, a company typically, you know, it'll have uh, some debt and so the cost of debt is easy to calculate. And then you put a risk premium over it, which is typically something from three to 5% and just that, you know. So once again, like I said, it's a recap here. So what's the cost of equity based on the CAPM? 
The risk-free rate is 7%, risk premium is 6%, beta 1.2. You plug it all in there, 14.2%. See, now you'll start seeing, you know, it's, it's exact and it's precise, and yet it's not. And that's how business is done. What is the discounted cash flow cost of equity from the DC valuation? So you're given this information, the past dividend, D0, not the next dividend, is $4.19. The current price is 50 bucks. The growth rate of dividends is 5%. So using this, you can calculate D1, right? D1 equals D0 times 1 plus G. So D1, <coughs> D1 is 4.19 times 1.05. And G is 0.05, you do the whole thing, is 13.8%. See, it's in the neighborhood, right? 14.2, 13.8. Risk premium, you tack on, you're like, all right, equity is definitely riskier than bonds. And, you know, you can calculate the cost of bonds because you've issued bonds, even though it's a non-public trading company, you know, it's not yet, uh, you don't have an IPO yet on it. And uh, so that's 14%. So in this case, um, you know, it's not the same as what you get with the cap M, but it produces a ballpark estimate. And that's the word, ballpark estimate. Eventually, it'll be a group of like senior looking directors of the company, if you know what I mean, sitting in a conference room and they'll have discussions for hours and uh, just sort of accept a number, you know. And you can average there. There you go, some kind of triangulation there. And so you say the average, you know, final estimate of cost of equity for this particular company is 14%. And this is how sort of IPOs are, uh, are priced in a certain way. Um, there are some really great cases, frankly speaking, you know, in the case book. One of them is the Netscape IPO. And when I taught a class here back in 2006 on management policy, actually, interestingly, I was uh, entrusted with doing the capstone class, management policy 649. I, I did that case when Netscape went IPO. How many of you know of a company called Netscape? Very good. Uh, I mean, if you don't know, that's not uh, very bad or, or bad. It's just uh, Netscape really, you know, changed, uh, it not only changed the scene, it just changed our lives, you know, it changed the entire generation. It, uh, it was based on uh, a company uh, called, uh, on the work of a company called Spyglass, which released the uh, first uh, mouse-based browser called Mozilla, uh, which was the work of a computer genius, 22, 23-year-old guy, Mark Anderson from University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, back in 92, 93, 94. And Netscape IPO then took that idea and you know, took that company and went public. It was one of the most heavily oversubscribed companies. So how do you value a company like that? And uh, so you know, what is the cost of equity for that company? And um, so uh, it was a very interesting IPO that, that really released and unleashed the whole internet phenomena, the internet age, if we can say that, you know. And, but that case is there anyway in your case book. So, so now that we have calculated or we know or done a recap on the cost of the three major components of the capital structure of a company, uh, we need to know the weights, right? So if we say that the cost of debt is 6%, the cost of preferred stock is uh, 9%, and the cost of equity is 14%, we can just average them, right? I mean, what if debt is 90%? So then it'll be 0.9 times 6%, basically. So we need to know the weights here. So that's the second part. Let me actually just fast forward so that you can see. This is the formula we are working towards, just that. Here are the weights we are calculating. And so I, I would think that nothing in this information is intricate. I think it's just new information and a different type of information, just that. <coughs> Excuse me. So determining the weights for the WACC. The weights are percentages of, of, of the firm that will be financed by each component. And we use target weights, not historical weights, because it's a new cost of capital we want to look at. Suppose the stock price is 50 bucks and there are 3 million shares of the stock. The firm has 25 million of preferred stock and 75 million of debt. So VCE is again notation, uh, valuation, the value of common equity, value of preferred stock, value of debt. So you multiply this by this, you get 150 million. The total value 
enterprise value sometimes called is 250 million dollars and so the weights for each of them are you know as you can you know very easily see is going to be 0 0.6 0 0.1 0 0.3 and i'm sure you've noticed that they add up to one as they should so the wacc is the weighted average cost of capital so the easy ones are that you have cost of equity or stock s <coughs> times the weight of common equity and we got 0.6 percent times 14 percent and you know where those numbers coming from preferred stock 0.1 times 9 percent and here's here's another little bit of new information there for that we have to make this adjustment one minus t which is also called the tax shield shield so the company is shielded just because of the law of the land that the interest that it pays on its debt is shielded by the corporate tax rate. And so in this case, it's 0.3 times 10%. How do we get that 10%? Remember that slide we had on the semi-annual bond pricing times 0.6. You add them up and the weighted average cost of capital is 11.1%. Just that. And this is something that is actually done. If any of you guys work in corporate finance, it's basically some kind of changes to this equation, but it is done. That's how a company determines, you know, what the cost of capital should be and what it can borrow, which will be the next thing. Next chapter is the hurdle rate. So if your, if your cost, of, uh, cost of borrow, which is this, and uh, the internal rate of return, you know, are, are higher or lower, depending, you will make a decision whether you're going to finance the project or not. That's why you're doing this. Sean? Is a tax shield similar to a pass-through tax, or is it different? Because I always thought of pass-through taxes and those, the way they structure the return so that the investor pays the taxes, not the corporation, instead of the double taxation situation. Hmm. I don't think it's the same. I would have to look into that. The, but this is uh, literally like the company's net earnings, the retained earnings, and then it has to, like the EBITDA earnings before interest tax, depreciation, amortization. And so in this case, that's called EBITDA. And so, so it would actually have to, it would actually have to pay that tax on its, on its total earnings. But part of those, before those earnings, you know, are, are, are taxed, it has to finance its debt. So it gets a tax shield on that. So I would think it's not a pass through, but I have to look in that. So here's something interesting. I've been wanting to do this research project uh, for many years, and uh, I got so many of so many open projects. I got like five papers that are like 75% done, and that's what actually, you know, as you guys probably know, keeps me up at night. Uh, just running every day, running, running hard, running a marathon at like 400 meters speed to try to finish them. But this is one project I want to do. I can do with any one of you. Uh, but haven't done anything on it. <clears throat> but anyway, what is this is, you can calculate the WACC of different firms. Now notice, there's a, there's sort of a, it seems like there's an inverse relationship between the cost of capital of technology firms versus sort of more, uh, more stable companies, uh, Georgia Pacific, Heinz, Coca-Cola, Walt Disney, and like that. These companies are financed more by debt and companies that are in the technology space, and obviously, as you can see, this is like dated slide here. I don't even think a company Bell South exists. Is the uh, proportion of debt is much lesser. But that is not my research question. My research question is: Is there a relationship that between VAC and Beta? Because an ocular examination, as I would say, will indicate that the Beta of Intel and Dell is probably higher than of Georgia Pacific, Heinz, and Coca-Cola, you know. So they have higher systematic risk. So if, if we find that kind of a relationship, how can that be useful for portfolio management? Well, beta is easily observable. And, and there may be a relationship embedded in WACC, which is a little bit more richer, a little bit more fundamental based, because beta is entirely price based. Is the covariance between the security in the market divided by the standard deviation of the security and the market. And so there are no fundamental factors that get in, whereas WACC is heavily into fundamental valuation. And so it may be a richer, so we could actually have a security prediction 
process where instead of beta, we have WACC. And as you know by now, I mean, that's not going to be accurate entirely, but if you think about it, it could be one additional layer of information. Just that, right? Just that. But that's like four or five years of work. No, I mean, I don't know of any place. I mean, you have to calculate your own beta. I mean, how would you know what the capital structure of Walmart and Home Depot is? Do you know that? I, I mean, we will have to really get into some uh, CompuStat tapes and things like that and download that information or strip that information and then do that. Are any of you planning on doing a doctorate in finance? That'd be an interesting thesis uh, idea. Anybody planning on going for a doctorate? I actually, every, every two years I write a reference for one student and two. One of my students is at Arizona State. One is in UMass Amherst. <clears throat> You know what, what you get when you get a PhD? Cause higher and deeper. Or a permanent head damage. <laughs> <laughs> so be sure if you want to go for a PhD. You'll get piled high and deep and a head damage too. But it may be worth it. <clears throat> the market may assign some value to it. What factors influence a company's WACC? Market conditions, firm's capital structure, dividend policy, and firm's investment policy. Uh, firms with riskier projects generally have a higher WACC and are expected to generate a return on capital greater than WACC. So this goes back into this uh, research uh, thought of mine that you know if you, if you have companies with higher WACC, do you think that they, are, they may be worth the risk because Theory says that they may have a higher expected return. So maybe you should populate your portfolio with companies with a higher weighted average cost of capital. Because take the numbers and the, and the arithmetic out of it. Uh, if there are a group of people that are willing to, uh, to finance their operations despite a higher cost of capital, either they're absolutely crazy or they're confident that their return is going to be higher than that already higher rate, you know. It's like if, 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 if let's say we have figured out a way to literally make, uh, make gold out of, uh, out of dirt, you know, and we've really figured it out. And then we go to the local bank here and we say, hey, you know, can you give us $10 million? For what? We say, this is the idea. I say, get out of here. All right, fine. We go to the next bank, you know, and we again say the same thing. And we say, well, we'll give you 25% on it. And market rate's like 5%, and they say, get out of here. We go to the next firm, you know, and say, just, just give us $25 million, you know. And we'll give you 50%, you know. So our cost is higher because we are confident that our return is going to be higher, you know. Because then we're going to buy the dirt for nothing, and, you know, 50% profit margin is still pretty good, right? You know. Just so you know, uh, the net net profit margin of asset management firms is about 0.9% a year. So your Vanguard, which is a $1 trillion firm, you know, it has like, its market value is not $1 trillion. The assets under management are $1 trillion, you know. So its net, net return, so $1 trillion is about $1,000 $1, billion, you know. So its net net, net re return after paying all its analysts and electricity and everything is, uh, 1% of that, that's about $10 billion, you know, which is still good, you know. So, but the margins are very thin. And it all comes from the expenses which you will be showing um, in your final portfolio projects. <clears throat> Why is the cost of internal equity from reinvested earnings cheaper than the cost of issuing new common stock? See, this comes back to the story that I was telling you about Tyco and uh, the $10,000 shower curtain and so on and so forth. Is when a company issues new common stock, they also have to pay flotation costs to the underwriter. <laughs> issuing new common stock, also called secondary offering, can send a negative signal to the capital markets which can de depress the stock price. It's basically called the dilution effect because the number of shares will go up 
and the company value doesn't change overnight, and so, and, uh, uh, and so the existing price will go down by 4 or 5% right away. And, but if the company had retained earnings, it would not have to have a second offering, a secondary offering, also called a SEO, Seasoned Equity Offering. So this is something you guys need to be familiar with. It's no big deal, but uh, uh, I'm introducing uh, flotation costs, uh, which is a sort of a transaction cost because life is real. You know, when you buy and sell a house, you know, you have to pay your broker, right, 2 to 6% or something like that. Unless if it's an FSBO sale, right? That's for sale by owner. FISBO, yeah. But still then, there is still some cost, right? Um, um, yeah. But there'd be some, still some stamp paper. Some wouldn't a lawyer have to get involved in it? At, no, really. Mm. Yeah. There'd be a forty-five dollar recording fee. Yeah. The okay. Yeah. The right. Yeah. 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 The state always has a way of getting its fingers in there tax. somewhere, right? <laughs> Just a little bit. Yeah. Transfer tax, right? So now let's say, let's estimate the cost of new common equity that has flotation costs. So guys, this, this, this may look different, but it's like there's just one change here, which is something in the denominator, okay? Otherwise, it's your classic di dividend uh, discount model, discount cash flow formulation. Your cost of equity is D1, that's D1, divided by an adjustment to the price and the growth rate. So just keep in mind, if the flotation cost is given as a percentage, you do 1 minus F. So it's like 15% that's 0.15. So the way to think of it, if it's 15%, uh, only 85% of the, of the price, the current price flows back to the company, right? So that's why you have 1 minus F. But if F is given to you as a dollar amount, so like in one situation we have like $2 given, so then it'd be just P0 minus dollar F. So you'll have to make that adjustment, okay? Uh, so when you make your formula sheets and all that, you can make, so if the dollar is given to you, then suppose it's two dollars and the fifty. So that's fifty minus two. That's forty-eight dollars is what goes to the company. And then once you plug it all in, you get fifteen point four percent. So not showing you mindless numbers. Um, so, so the cost of equity is now higher. Remember, without flotation cost, it was thirteen point eight percent. Should I refresh your memory on that? If you remember here. See here, there was no flotation cost here. There was no 50 times 1 minus F. So it was 13.8. So with flotation cost, it's more expensive for a company. And that's why they should be very careful with their retained earnings. And there's a, there, there has been great misuse and abuse of retained earnings. And um, actually, I, uh, back in 2004, um, I did a class just on corporate governance at Drexel University, which is <coughs> a university in Philadelphia uh, in their executive MBA program. It was just a one credit class, uh, but that was just on corporate governance. That topic was so hot because the failure of corporate governance, actually. <coughs> <coughs> so now I'm introducing flotation costs. Estimate the cost of new 30-year debt uh, when the flotation cost is 2%. So you use a financial calculator, you're, you're quite uh, familiar with that. So here are the basic inputs. N equal 30. The present value note is where you make the adjustment. Is whatever is generated currently, 2% of that will go to the investment bankers. So it's 1,000 times 1 minus 0 0.02, so that's $980 there. And the payment... Now notice the payment also major adjustment is done. It's 10% because it's annual. We're not doing 10% divided by 2. So it's 10% of 1,000 times 1 minus 0.4 because the company is getting a tax shield. Even though it probably pays out you know, the whole amount, but then it gets $40, $40 back from the government. And the future value is minus 1,000. So solving, you get the cost of debt after, after tax, uh, cost of debt with flotation cost is 6%, 6.15. Basically, you can read these slides, but the bottom line is you want to use the current interest rate on new debt, uh, not the historical. 
because remember you are raising capital for something in the future actually not the past does hmm, that you don't use book weights to estimate the the capital structure use target capital structure to determine the weights and that's the homework on on this once again <laughs> and that concludes this short chapter on cost of capital which feeds into our next chapter on capital budgeting methods with an extremely important chapter uh, where I will specifically show you how to calculate net present value and internal rate of return which are very fundamental finance themes and used in corporate finance very much even today.